EU Commission has sons awarded over 50,000 euro in direct orders. Testing for genetic disorders of pre-implanted embryos will become law. And a former top gaming official has been charged with money laundering and bribery. All this and more on Love and Daily. Good evening and welcome to Love and Daily. I'm Tim Diakono, joined today by Julian Bonici. And we do have a range of stories to discuss today. Jul, let's, let's get started. Yes, hi, thanks everyone for joining what's going to be the penultimate episode of Love and Daily. You can check out the finale tomorrow. It's going to be an exciting show for everybody who's followed us along the way. But just to get started, the son of e the son, sorry, of EU Commissioner Helena Dalli were awarded some 50,000 euros worth in direct orders while she was still a cabinet member. Documents tabled by Economy Minister Silvio Schembri following a parliamentary question by Ivan Castillo revealed that between 2017 and 2018, Luke Dalli and Jean-Marc Dalli pocketed around €35,000 and around €17,500 in direct orders, respectively. Luke Dalli was actually awarded three separate direct orders, basically for the provision of services related to communication, supporting legal services on the field of intellectual property while Jean Magdali was handed one direct order for assistance and services in connection with the presidency of the European Council. At the time, um, Helena Dalli was still the Minister for, Foreign, for European Affairs and Equality and had not yet been appointed EU Commissioner. However, at the time, the Economy Ministry was actually headed by disgraced former Minister Chris Cardona. We know all about the allegations facing with him. You can read all about it on loveandmorda.com. Obviously, that's not to say that the Dali brothers are, should not get government jobs. However, question will, questions will be asked exactly why a public call was never issued for a position that was ultimately awarded to two children of a cabinet member. There seems to be no concern, you know, for this kind of practice at the time. Hopefully, that is changing at the moment. The list of consultants awarded a direct order also includes a former PLMP, Joe Samut, who made just over 36,000 euros. Um, meanwhile, Luke Dali is actually well known to have procured quite a few government contracts. He was a well-known one, one TV presenter and at point was actually working as a legal officer at the same time he was also getting these direct orders earning above about 23,000 give or take above then. That's not the only familial relationship within the employment industry of Dali's children. Luke Dali's once girlfriend, Rachel De Bourne, had actually found herself on the state um, payroll as a person of trust within Minister Dali's secretariat. Obviously, this continues to highlight the rampant nepotism uh, in the country, where unfortunately there seem to be no checks on balances for these kinds of employment. Uh, I would like to think, you know, things are improving swiftly because they truly are necessary. Yeah, of course, Malta is a small country, so um, <clears throat> some kind of some of these old things tend to happen. But it is quite peculiar how um, wonder of wonders the same people keep getting multiple jobs, multiple direct orders straight from. Um, from 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 the government, which uh, is is um, which their relatives are well are, are form form a, a huge part of. Um, meanwhile, Health Minister Chris Fern has revealed plans of the governments of the government's plans to update Malta's IVF laws, confirming that pre-genetic testing of embryos will be allowed. So, strongly strongly hinted during the election campaign, and he has now confirmed that this will be the case. What this means is that p p parents with hereditary genetic disorders uh, will be allowed to get their embryos tested. So before IVF, you have a, an option of, uh, while going undergoing IVF, you have an option of which embryos to pick. It won't be chosen, they won't be chosen at random, they get a chance to test them um, under specific, f for specific uh, conditions, such as Huntington's, such as ganglios or doses, very serious genetic conditions um, that are fatal and there are, there are no, there's no known cure for. And this is a boon to them because they allow them to give birth to a child without uh, knowing or, or, or fearing that they're going to be giving this child an instant death wish. However, the problem is that it's, there's, a, there's a worrying caveat to this law, which is that those embryos that are tested and found to have the genes for Huntington's, for gangrenous doses, for these other genetic disorders, aren't going to be discarded or put up for research. They're going to be frozen again, 
uh, to and if uh, the way the process works is that uh, the, the parents have right, the right of first refusal, obviously, over their own embryos. They have, I think, every five years or so, they can get to, they have to be asked, do you still want these embryos? Uh, until the woman reaches a 46th birthday, uh, when, which is now the maximum age for IVF. If that age is reached and those embryos are still in the freezer, those embryos will be seized by the state and put up for adoption. Obviously, the question is, who on earth is going to, do, to adopt a baby, an embryo, um, give birth to an embryo, knowing that this embryo is going to develop into a child with a very serious genetic condition um, that, will, that will kill them soon, instead of, giving, of, of choosing a healthy embryo, instead of not even adopting an embryo, but get using your own embryos. I mean, I might be wrong, but I don't think a single person on the planet will, will pick up this embryo. So it begs the question as to why it's being introduced in the law. Yes, uh, unfortunately, when uh, things deal with birth and IVF and Malta, this kind of proposal reeks of, you know, the government, the minister trying to appease, you know, a very strong pro-life uh, sentiment in Malta. You know, people couldn't fathom, you know, I remember even when surrogacy was floated um, a little bit, the idea that some embryos might get discarded in the process. Unfortunately, you know, it's a reality that has to happen, you know, with, the, with these things, you know, it's an unfortunate reality, but these sort of funny ways to appease everyone doesn't please anyone really what i find really interesting about this ivf proposal though as well as they're going to open up gamete donation to non-blood uh, familial relatives right so like let's say if you had a brother-in-law or a sister or you know who a sister-in-law who helps can help donate it's going to really sort of uh, uh, help help in the process opening it up you know to a lot of people you know let's say for example if they were a lesbian couple you know something like that you know to sort of keep you know, that's something uh, in, in there. There are ethical issues over there, of course. Of course, of course, of course. But, you know, this is the proposal that's coming forward. On to our next story. Uh, Jason Farooja, the former chief technological technology officer at the Malta Gaming Authority, has been charged with money laundering along with his wife. Farooja and his wife, Christine, pleaded not guilty to the charges earlier today. However, bail was denied by a court as investigations are still ongoing while their assets are are also frozen. As reported within the Times of Malta, they have both been charged with money laundering, but Jason Farooja has also been charged with extortion, accepting bribes, trading in influence, and disclosing confidential information, among a host of other offences. It's a case we all saw coming. Uh, last December, Farooja was actually suspended from the MGA over the improper use of MGA data, and the police were immediately informed of Farooja's case and opened up an investigation. Obviously, we'll find more more details about the exact intricacies of the crime involved in the coming week, so stay tuned for any sittings involving Jason Farooja. Uh, unfortunately, it's just another case um, of sort of MGA, you know, unethical behavior that has been under the microscope since the arrest and charge of its former CEO, Heathcliff Farooja, in connection to another trading of influence investigation linked to Jorgen Fennec, the main suspect in the Daphne Caruana Galizia assassination. Now, this latest charge is obviously very worrying in the context of Heathcliff Farooja as well. It really does start to give the impression that at least before changes were instituted, MGA was really under con controls of people who allegedly had criminal intent, which is super worrying for what turns out to be, you know, what was one of leading, leading industries and that could be, you know, under the risk by the reputational damage these people have done. Yeah, more gaming is, is, which is one of Malta's big economic sectors. There's already, it's, it's already, um, I wouldn't say problematic, but it does, uh, it, a lot, low, large sums of money do pass through it, which does put under the microscope of, um, of, of, of even of the world as well. Now hearing the fact that, that, that people, even the fact that people from Europe or from other places can come to Malta and, 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 and put a whole load of cash and, and, and donate it. So there has to be very strict safeguards to to keep the industry in place at the end of the day and hearing that um, someone from the regulator <coughs> itself if you please is uh, is involved in money potential money laundering and and extortion yeah it doesn't it doesn't do us any favors at least action has been taken 
Meanwhile, Mark Maleri, uh, the, the former book council chairman and author, has been ordered to, to, to appear in court under arrest after failing to turn up in a sitting um, involving Labour MP Rosian Kotayar. So the case, is, uh, the case started when Mark Maleri claimed in his book that Kotayar had a, had a sexual relationship with Jorgen Fenech. Uh, Kotayar Kota denied it and um, Mark Kamelier then started writing on his blog um, you know, if you, I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to make you an offer, <laughs> get out of politics for good, and I'll and I'll remove what I've written about you. This is a trade. She saw it as a threat. She reported to the police. The police charged him, Mark Camilleri, with threatening her and taunting her. He hasn't appeared to court. He's even in Malta, and now um, he's being summoned by the courts to appear in Malta under, under arrest. He has uploaded a blog post saying that he does intend to to appear in court but without eating a date or, or a time or anything. But he said, I, I, it's, it's, I will appear in court. Yeah, personally, I have to say, I think it's quite a worrying case that the police uh, even took up. You know, you have to question why the police are even pursuing this harassment and threatening cost case, particularly when a libel case is instituted. You know, uh, reeks to me of criminal libel, but not, but in a different shape or form. Um, really makes you question, you know, considering all the things the police have not done, have not investigated, have not charged to pursue a case like this. I don't know. I find it really worrying, particularly since it's uh, it's an MP. Uh, Hopefully they see sense. Uh, I, I'll be holding. I won't be holding my breath uh, for it. Uh, on to our last story. Uh, Minister for Health Chris Fern has officially said there are no cases of monkeypox in Malta. Monkeypox has become the latest boogeyman word, particularly after the COVID-19 pandemic. But I want to remind everyone out there that, listen, it's a really mild and noticeable, very important infection. And human transmission is relatively difficult and requires close contact. If you've been following social media and one social media profile in particular, there have been wild claims, false claims about monkeypox in Malta. And it's actually led to Chris Fern having to deny the case, uh, deny, deny the stories in a press conference today, actually the press conference we're talking about before. In his words, until now, there have been no cases of monkeypox in our country. And even assuring people that, listen, we are really well prepared to fight the virus should the cases emerge and insisted, you know, this is not going to be another COVID-19 where things spread, you know, out of control. So far, over 100 cases of monkeypox have been confirmed in Europe. What's really, I mean, lucky, I mean, about monkeypox is that it's a very noticeable disease. So if you start no noticing the system, start noticing a rash, don't go close to people and you'll be treated very, very easily. There currently exists no evidence that the virus has mutated and the WHO situation has said the situation is containable. What's important stories like this, I think, and Tim would probably agree, is, you know, don't believe everything you see on social media. Just because someone posts it, you know, wait for the official announcement, we have official figures, and also look up over the disease monkeypox so that's the word monkey sounds very scary but it isn't uh, at all and don't um, I mean let's learn our lessons and don't and not start uh, clamoring for the government to to restrict our lives further like some people are doing and saying everyone should be tested at the airport like no there are other things to worry about um, and and let's see this, this disease for what it is. And that brings us to the end of the penultimate episode of Love and Daily. Make sure to follow loveandmortal.com and have an evening full of love.